I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how OCI itself is transforming as a business to capitalize um, on, I guess, what people are calling the hydrogen opportunity. So from our perspective, you know, we've been in the uh, ammonia space uh, for over a decade. We're top three in the world. On the methanol side, we're top five in the world uh, that we've grown over time. So our DNA has been one of kind of entrepreneurial growth. I think we're quite blessed with our industrial footprint in that we have ammonia and methanol storage in the Beaumont, Texas area next to Houston, which is a major bunkering hub. We have the only ammonia import terminal in Rotterdam, one of the busiest um, bunkering hubs in the world in the Netherlands. And we have methanol storage in Rotterdam as well. Uh, in the Middle East, we have a large ammonia exporting platform in both uh, Algeria, which is a day's sail sailing away from Gibraltar, and in Egypt um, at the mouth of the Suez Canal. So one of the busiest transport hubs in the world. We have ammonia infrastructure and storage there and the only ammonia exporting facility that's world scale and dedicated in Egypt. And in Abu Dhabi, we're very close to the Fujairah market with our um, Abu Dhabi based uh, urea and ammonia production today and uh, the 1 million ton blue ammonia plant that we announced with, uh, with ADNOC as well. Frontiers and Pioneers, in association with Sempra Infrastructure. Hello and welcome to LNG TV. I'm Will Dawson and it's a pleasure to welcome to the show Ahmed Al Hoshi, Chief Executive Officer of OCI, a leading global producer and distributor of nitrogen products. Today we'll be discussing the importance of green hydrogen and fueling future energy demand, what is required to bring a hydrogen energy economy to life, and how organizations like OCI can adapt to thrive during the energy transition. Ahmed, a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me, Will. Great to be on. Brilliant. Diving straight in if we can, Ahmed. Um, OCI is a proponent of the hydrogen economy, a way to decarbonize um, sectors of our economy, such as heavy industry, food, transport, and energy. Um, how do you see this transition in practical terms and is it really achievable given the timescales available? No, I think it's a good question. I mean, we're very excited at OCI, given that we're a large uh, con consumer of hydrogen in the form of natural gas today. And, uh, and the two main products we produce are ammonia and methanol that, uh, that are basically safe, easy to use, easy to transport products when handled correctly. Um, and can be used to decarbonize, like you said, a significant amount of uh, industries. So like we look at ag, we look at um, fuels on the transport side, uh, chemical uh, feedstocks into the industry and waste. And those are all areas we all know we have to focus on decarbonizing over the coming decades. There will definitely be challenges. It's going to be both private and public cooperation together, together to, get, uh, to get there. But, um, but definitely a lot of potential with these uh, commodities uh, to be able to introduce them to new customers that aren't using them today. And how should we be thinking about the challenge of scaling it? Because this is often something uh, leveled at the emergent hydrogen energy economy. Yeah, I mean, from a scaling perspective, you know, a lot of things have to work together. You're working with new customers in new, uh, in, uh, new geographies. There's the regulatory side, there's the certification side. You want the life cycle analysis on the emissions. Um, you want to ensure that, you know, the products that you're using have been adequately decarbonized. So it's not, a, it's not an easy feat. Uh, there are definitely several obstacles to work together on. Uh, but the, the good thing is that, you know, with the drives after following COP26 and into the next few uh, years, we're seeing a lot of momentum from, uh, you know, the broader society, from governments, from people talking to their governments, looking to, uh, to, to find a solution so that we get ourselves on a trajectory of uh, reducing global warming. And uh, I think that uh, there will obviously be some lessons learned along the way, but uh, when when it makes sense from a political and societal back uh, from a society perspective that that's one element of it the next and important element is to make the business case work and what we're happy to see is a lot of businesses looking for uh, you know where where's the economic case to to invest in this and 
many, uh, many, many in our sector, as well as those outside of our sector, are looking at uh, different hydrogen pathways to achieve that and putting a lot of resources towards it. Planning uh, must be incredibly difficult at the moment with so much price volatility in the energy markets. Um, I'd be interested to get your take on what you, you, you expect to see over the next sort of three to five years as companies think about this transition to hydrogen. Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, from our perspective, uh, whether it's at OCI or our uh, joint venture with Adnoc Fertiglobe that we listed last year, you know, we're, we're familiar with commodity risk. And, uh, you know, we have had uh, paradigm shifts like the shale revolution in the United States uh, earlier in uh, the last decade. Um, you've seen, uh, for example, more, more recently, natural gas in Europe uh, go up from a, around 5 to $6 MMBTU over the last five years, jump up to 30, 40, even touching $60 MMBTU in the last month. So, you know, that makes things quite difficult, but that's the type of commodity risk that I think a lot of the firms in our space are used to. What adds a big element uh, that you now have to think about is what, what does it look like strategically and globally, given what governments are doing, what subsidies and programs are being put in place, the build back uh, in infrastructure bills in the United States, uh, the Green Deal fit for 55 in Europe, you know, what's being done in Asia. So that added a regulatory element is a challenge. And what we try to do is, you know, look and focus on the low hanging fruit. What do we have good visibility on and focus on low cost investments that have a high margin of safety so that we can be comfortable making those bets and being able to succeed in a regulatory environment that will continue to be uncertain. I guess picking up from that, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how OCI itself is transforming as a business to capitalize um, on, I guess, what people are calling the hydrogen opportunity. Yeah, so stepping back in terms of the, the two products that we produce, and we produce obviously downstream versions of that, are the ammonia and methanol. So from our perspective, you know, we've been in the uh, ammonia space uh, for over a decade. We're top three in the world. On the methanol side, we're top five in the world. Uh, that we've grown over time. So our DNA has been one of kind of entrepreneurial growth, uh, moving very quickly. Uh, we had no presence in the United States uh, about a decade ago, and now we have, you know, uh, approximately 500 people. Uh, we have uh, several million tons of capacity and have made investments in, in, in different locations. there. So we like growth and we embrace it. So what we've done is kind of gone back into growth mode for ammonia and methanol. Um, from 2016 to 2020, I'd say that we've been in generally a downturn in both the uh, you know, ammonia markets and to some extent methanol. And we've seen that resurgence in demand because the solution to low prices is low prices in the commodity space. So we had low prices following a lot of overbuilding from 2016 to 2020. And we were focused on our, internally our own businesses delivering products that we brought online um, you know, reducing costs and focusing on how to uh, operate better and, and sell better. What we've done now is, is uh, basically go back to, you know, our previous DNA from the, in the prior decade, which is one of growth. And we've geared ourself, uh, ourselves up to evaluate projects, looking at countless projects globally to decarbonize our sites. Um, and like I, like I said earlier, picking the ones that make the most sense. And uh, we've made, made several project announcements in the US, in, uh, in Europe, as well as in the Middle East over the last year, and have started redeploying resources and adding resources uh, to, uh, to help execute on these projects, uh, basically a, a part of the business that had been dormant for several years, given uh, where we stood in the commodity cycle. It would be great if you could tell me a little bit more about some of these investments. Sure. So in uh, in the United States, for example, we made an announcement a couple of months ago that uh, we are um, working with the 45Q program, which is one for carbon sequestration in the United States, to work with a BlackRock-backed uh, developer called Navigator to sequester almost half a million tons of carbon dioxide a year in our production to render our our normal ammonia production into what's called blue ammonia. So basically consuming natural gas, but capturing a portion of the carbon and putting it in the ground and then reducing our GHG footprint for our, for our downstream products. Um, in the Middle East, for example, we're working on a 100 megawatt electrolyzer 
using plug power technology and working with the Norwegian company Skatec to bring online in a very short time frame what would be potentially the largest green hydrogen production facility in the world to be used with our existing green ammonia plant. Um, in Abu Dhabi, we announced alongside our partner ADNOC um, the, uh, the, the building of a 1 million ton per annum blue ammonia plant, which is using lower carbon hydrogen as a feedstock rather than traditional natural gas to produce blue ammonia and sell that to global markets. And we brought in uh, GS Energy and Mitsui as uh, minority investors with us and potential off-takers who are looking to use ammonia uh, as a as a reduced um, carbon uh, fuel into various uh, end markets in uh, in uh, in Korea and Japan. And on the methanol side, we've already been quite uh, active on the on the biomethanol side, where we're the largest biomethanol producer in the world, which is a low carbon methanol. So we've been really focusing commercially on growing that business, finding it as a great second generation biofuel to blend with gasoline uh, and reduce emissions significantly more so than even first generation uh, biofuels like ethanol that, that, that go off of, uh, you know, food as a, as a feedstock, uh, you know, corn, sugar. We're using waste as a feedstock effectively and decarbonizing the vehicle, vehicular sector. So it's really about kind of Pursuing those projects that we see, there are regulatory um, backdrops that are helpful, or in the case of the Middle East, for example, in Egypt, we have a great wind and solar corridor to feed renewable uh, electricity um, into our plants and actually change the feedstock from natural gas into uh, one that is lower carbon. So in terms of all these investments, uh, clearly an incredibly exciting time. Um, I guess my question is, you know, how quickly do you see the demand for these products increasing? And secondary, where do you see this kind of demand initially originating from? So I'll start with methanol, then move to uh, to ammonia. So on on the methanol side, and kind of I, I gave you a little bit of overview of what we're doing on the biomethanol side, but more broadly, you know, we see that using methanol, which is CH3OH, which can be used and, and, and burned as a fuel in a clean way, especially when it's produced upstream, not from natural gas, but from, you know, waste or hydrogen or other sources, as a great fuel, easy to transport, easy to store, much like a refined product, and can be blended with gasoline. It's done so, you know, there are cars that run on methanol in China today and have for several years, 100% methanol, 85% methanol, and lower blends of methanol. In the UK, uh, you know, a portion of gasoline in the UK is methanol. Uh, one to 2% of uh, UK gasoline is actually just blend, uh, is, uh, is when you look at petrol, it's methanol is a, is a portion of it. We supply that biomethanol into that market here. In terms of that demand, we're seeing it today in the vehicular market. What we're very excited about is the shipping uh, market, which we can spend a bit more time uh, talking about for, for the future of methanol. We think that that's probably, given there are already ships on the water, we can start seeing it really scale up with, uh, for example, the recent announcement by Maersk of ordering 12 container vessels to be delivered uh, you know, before the middle of the decade. So 2023, 2024, 2025, you know, you're starting to see significant increases in demand that can be those 12 ships alone, almost, you know, half to 1% of methanol demand globally today. So those types of initiatives and you're seeing other uh, companies come in and, and make these orders on the methanol side mean that we think that towards the middle of the decade, we should see a good tick up in this uh, lower carbon methanol demand in the shipping space, but we're already seeing it uh, on the vehicular side in road transport. On the ammonia side, I'd say it's a bit longer term. So on the ammonia side, the engine for uh, for ships to be able to rerun on ammonia, whether it's gray, blue, or green ammonia, low, uh, zero carbon ammonia, that's in development now. We're working with MAN, the engine manufacturer, and uh, a couple of uh, shipping companies like Eastern Pacific, as well as the Hartman Group in Germany, Eastern Pacific out of Singapore and the Hartman Group in Germany, on basically ordering ammonia-powered vessels to move our own ammonia. So timing of that we see is probably 2020, when that, to have the ships on the water as early as 2025, maybe 2026, but that can ramp up quite quickly. 
Um, and it's about making those investments now in decarbonizing our feedstock. And we think that being an incumbent in the space and being a large producer in the space is a very big advantage versus a green field that allows us to take baby steps, I'll call them baby or incremental steps in so that we can get ahead of that demand and show that there's supply there so that people can make that bet and say, you know what, I'm going to use methanol or I'm going to use ammonia as a fuel in the future. And from a demand perspective, specifically within the shipping industry, where do you see it coming from for green uh, methanol and ammonia? Sure. So shipping is about 3% of global greenhouse gases today. And I think we all recognize, you're seeing the IMO making moves, the EU, the US Asian markets are all looking and saying, well, we understand shipping is, is a necessary way to move uh, you know, heavy products over long distances. So shipping is always going to be around for the next several decades. The question is how to decarbonize it. We think that it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, we think that there's a lot of growth on ammonia from not, essentially nothing today on, on shipping. For, for methanol, which is it has a few ships, has a lot of ways to grow. And there are going to be other uh, ways to, uh, to basically fuel um, different uh, shipping lines, whether it's container, uh, liquids, uh, bulk carriers. And we've already seen orders being placed on the container side, on the bulk side, on liquid vessels for methanol and ammonia. So we think it's gonna be, you know, those big shipping uh, providers that are saying, I'm now making a decision for the next 25 years for a new ship because I wanna upgrade my fleet. Do I wanna have the option to fuel it with ammonia? Do I wanna have the option to fuel it with methanol? And increasingly, the answer is appearing to be yes. Doesn't mean that they have to use that going forward, they have to make the economics work. And they're gonna look at the economics work and the ability to deliver it. At OCI and at Ferdi Globe, our joint venture with Adnoc, I think we're quite blessed with our industrial footprint in that we have ammonia and methanol storage in the Beaumont, Texas area next to Houston, which is a major bunkering hub. We have the only ammonia import terminal in Rotterdam, one of the busiest um, bunkering hubs in the world in the Netherlands. And we have methanol storage in Rotterdam as well. Uh, in the Middle East, we have a large ammonia exporting platform in both uh, Algeria which is a day's sail sailing away from Gibraltar and in Egypt um, at the mouth of the Suez Canal. So one of the busiest transport hubs in the world, we have ammonia infrastructure and storage there and the only ammonia exporting facility that's world scale and dedicated in Egypt. And in Abu Dhabi, we're very close to the Fujera market with our um, Abu Dhabi based uh, urea and ammonia production today and uh, the 1 million ton blue ammonia plant that we announced with uh, with Adnoc as well. So you've already, you, you have the production base there, you have the bunkering to be able to deliver. We're working with uh, Lloyd's and other um, other players in the shipping industry to get, uh, you know, more comfort around the supply side, the safety side, the certification side, so that we can see that demand grow quickly and be able to offer that to uh, to um, to customers and shipping customers over the coming few years. So, how do the economics work? Yeah, the, the economics is is very much a big challenge. So, one way, obviously, the simple one is subsidies and grants from the governments, and obviously, they're still figuring out what to focus on and everything like that. Why the economics is an important question is that you're going to continue to see announcements of green methanol, green ammonia projects globally. We saw that ten years ago when we entered into the U.S. market. Natural gas was low in the United States. The, on paper, the margins were huge to produce ammonia and methanol on paper in the first half of the last decade. And there were over 20 projects announced in both spaces. Almost every single project that was done by a newcomer or a greenfield project never went into fruition. They spent millions of dollars, they got off takes, they did engineering, but it didn't move forward. Because you have to you have to realize you're going to market that's commodity variable. Project financing banks are not used to getting into that volatile, volatile commodity. And um, also you have to pay for the debt service that can be a significant cash cost per ton that adds on for these projects, whether it's principal or interest payments. We see the same thing happening now with green ammonia and green methanol projects. The, there's a lot that needs to get them to work. And today the green ammonia project uh, price in particular still has to develop. It's a market that still needs to develop. So in shipping in particular, where we have, you know, where we're encouraged by the medium to long term, we're going to bridge that by making incremental steps, decarbonizing five to 10% of our existing natural gas consumption so that we can offer that green 
methanol and ammonia and capitalize on our existing downstream production of methanol and ammonia, the infrastructure in place, and, uh, and, and the bunkering capabilities. In the shipping way, we see, to your, to your question, two ways to, de- to, to do that decarbonization and pay for. One is that you pass it on ultimately in the price downstream. So you go B to B to C, for example, you're going to go to a shipping company. Shipping company sells it to their, um, their ultimate customer and you pass it on and you can have that be a low price in the, the final price of the good because shipping is a small percentage of it. The other way is to develop the carbon markets with the carbon border adjustment mechanism that people are looking at in Europe. I think that's very important. So you have visibility and transparency on the carbon that's produced outside of Europe when you're competing with European production that has to look at carbon as a price. The voluntary markets need to move into, uh, in the United States, for example, into one that has a price for carbon. And the beauty of it is, for example, today, when you're looking at carbon in the 80, 90 euros a ton uh, price level, and you factor that into the the price of heavy fuel oil when you're using it as shipping fuel, green ammonia that we can produce today can actually be competitive with that fuel oil if you were to put in the actual pricing of carbon associated with consuming that fuel oil. And that's that's the way that you can get, you know, basically customers to move to say, I want to offset this cost by um, by recognizing the price of carbon, that externality I've created that I never paid for before. Uh, and be able to use a lower carbon source and be able to to pay for the additional cost that we have to incur um, to move away from fossil fuels as a feedstock. Absolutely. Um, Ahmed, switching gears slightly, if we may, um, kind of given my background, um, I kind of personally believe the transition to a low carbon economy is as much of a people challenge as a technology challenge. Um, so two questions, really. Firstly, do you agree? Uh, and secondly, how prepared do you personally feel for the challenge ahead? Absolutely, I agree. I mean, it, it's it's interesting that you know, from our perspective, uh, when you look at when you when you look at our business, we have significant uh, investments that have gone in the ground, and you know, people actually, you know, unlike for example the financial services space, uh, the cost of labor is actually a smaller portion of the overall cost base. Our biggest cost is natural gas today and the future could be a renewable electricity or something else as we decarbonize over time. But our biggest cost is not people. Well, what that means is, you know, the silver lining of that is that, um, you know, you you can afford to incentivize people that work within OCI uh, and Fertiglobe um, to to grow the business. And what we're really focused on is, is, you know, cultivating a, a, basically a culture here that's focused on that entrepreneurial perspective. Going back to the growth that we've done in the past, we realized that you can only get things done by people coming up with ideas, by evaluating them, by executing them, and then by bringing them online so that you can actually run plants that uh, that run on, for example, lower carbon uh, products. What I think we've been dealt and we've been blessed to have, and I as a CEO have been blessed to have, is in terms of purpose, our purpose has never been stronger. Uh, you know, 10 years ago when we were growing our business, we, it was one of pro- providing ammonia, which goes into nitrogen fertilizer to feed the world. And that's been a strong purpose throughout. But now we can couple it with this hydrogen economy and an ability to decarbonize so many different sectors that people can see them making changes you know, within OCI, which is a relatively kind of small organization and relatively new compared to some of the com- companies that have been around for for 100 years or so, where people know that they can make an individual difference. Because we're growing so quickly, we're not uh, a well-oiled machine that has tons of bureaucracy, many different layers, uh, everything segmented. No, individuals have very strong access to the top within the organization. It's a very flat structure. And people like working here because they know that if they if they have an idea and they bring it forward, they can really push it through and and actually see a change within a few years. You know, coming out of an idea that they've come up. It's it's an exciting time, but equally, um, you know, every organization is bottom line focused. You know, what would you say are some of the toughest challenges that you as a CEO face motivating your stakeholders, be them employees, partners, customers, um, as you move forward into the energy transition? So I'll start with the employees and then maybe we can discuss the customers and other stakeholders. But from the employee perspective, um, you know, it's been very challenging with COVID-19, which is now hitting on kind of two years of living with it. So making sure that our people are safe in terms of continuing to operate our plants has been 
paramount. I think we've been, uh, you know, the what we did is we created an internal task force two years ago when the, sh- the first shutdowns were happening in uh, March, April, May of 2020. And I have to commend that we had one of our most prolific uh, delivery quarters, which was Q2 of 2020, despite the global shutdown, because these are essential commodities that we're producing and the team really came through to do that. Another challenge, like you said, from a people perspective is having enough capacity, work-life balance, and so, uh, and also, you know, having some of the capabilities to, to do some of these projects. So we've been hiring significantly over the last year um, and are continuing to hire, looking for strong people to work within the organization and, and grow new business lines effectively that, uh, that we're looking uh, to grow to capitalize on this opportunity. So the challenge has been, uh, you know, one of safety and it's been one of basically making sure that we don't get people too overloaded because we're working on more things than we were working on by, by multiple factors uh, just in the last year. Um, and, and so we, we haven't held back because of that, because the fact is our largest cost is, is not people. We can afford to bring on strong people into the organization and integrate them well. In terms of customers, I think one of the big challenges is, is the same thing that we're looking at, which is how do you decarbonize? How do you want to set targets up? People are more focused. Shareholders and LPs and funds, uh, institutional investors are saying, um, you know, we're not going to we're not going to stand by and see, you know, our overall um, global environment have, uh, you know, have detrimental, the detrimental impacts, you know, decades down the line. We need to take action now. So they're looking to decarbonize. And we find that the solution is when you look all the way upstream to a company like OCI or Fertiglobe, that is the one producing the CO2 to deliver deliver these essential commodities, they look back to us and they're trying to find that solution. And they have the same issue that we do, which is the regulatory and commodity uncertainty. How do we pay for it? That's the big question. And so when I go back to the example of shipping, which is one one we like, they're custom. They're, for example, if you're going to a Levi's, right, and they're looking to decarbonize and deliver something or a Unilever, they're setting zero carbon net zero carbon targets. Uh, and the way to achieve that is how can we make those changes, pay for those products, allow for decarbonization, while still being able to have a competitive product in the industry. In the case of using, for example, green ammonia as a fuel, I mean, it's estimated with, you know, by the end of this decade, green ammonia as a fuel, if you were to use that instead of regularly, regular heavy fuel oil and transport a pair of jeans from East Asia into Europe, the incremental cost would be around 11 euro cents. So that's something that's palatable where you can say these fuel, these, uh, these genes have been delivered in a sustainable way. I'm willing to pay for that as a customer. And when you factor it all the way back through, that allows us to take the steps upstream to decarbonize our business and deliver those, uh, those commodities uh, downstream for our customers. And uh, you've already hit a lot of these points, but transitioning to the uh, clean energy economy um, is going to require a new set of skills. Um, how much of a skill gap do you believe we face? Uh, and are there specific things that OCI are doing to help close it? Yeah, I mean, I think that when the, the key skill we think is about taking a bit more of a holistic view, not getting too compartmentalized. You have to look at the operational side. You have to look at the commercial side. You have to look at the regulatory side. And so I think we we have that benefit despite the fact that, you know, we're not as you know, I'd say large and bureaucratic in terms of the organization that uh, it's because of a factor of our of our age as a company in the in the nitrogen and methanol space, we think that we can capitalize on that advantage that 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 nimbleness so that people can come together quickly, can bring minds together quickly in teams, and we can move quickly. So the the skills gap, what we've been trying to build a bit further is on the regulatory side, uh, given all the developments, the uncertainties, government initiatives that, uh, that, for example, in Europe have many different competing voices, we've been you know, bu- building up in that space. In terms of the technical side, I mean, we have a very strong technical team. What we've had to do is add more resources to that technical team so that they can continue to run our business every day that you know, produces ammonia and methanol and downstream products into the market while having the capacity to build and develop new projects uh, like the electrolysis projects, the ammonia projects, some of the things we're looking at on the methanol side. So it's been one more of 
I'd say regulatory additions uh, in terms of capabilities, uh, you know, understanding what's happening from the stakeholders on the government side. And the other one has been on the project side, just having additional resources so that we can um, capitalize on our, like I said, our incumbency status um, to when we undertake projects, not distract from our own manufacturing goals for our existing platform. Ahmed, thank you so very much for your time today. It seems like OCI is phenomenally well placed to capitalize on the hydrogen energy economy. Um, and we wish you all and the team all the very best heading into 2022 and beyond. Thank you very much, Will. Great, uh, great to be on and great discussion. And thank you all very much for watching today's episode of Frontiers and Pioneers. I've been Will Dawson. Look forward to speaking to you next time. Frontiers and Pioneers in association with Sempra Infrastructure. Thank you.